Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you. As the director of Goethe Institute Max Müller Bar One Mumbai, I am having the pleasure of opening this online release of the catalog for Architecture of Practice, Research, Reflections, and Reformulations, RMA Architects 1990 to 2020, the recently concluded exhibition at MMB Gallery, curated by Kaiwan Meta. Breaking away from the general format of exhibition catalogs, this publication focuses equally on the larger questions surrounding practice through interviews and exhibition research. Produced by Goethe Institute and the Architecture Foundation, copies will be available at our institute in Kalagoda and at the Architecture Foundation. We are very happy to have Philippe Saru, director of CEPT Press and CEPT Archives with us today to release the book followed by a discussion with the curator of the exhibition, Taiwan Meta. They will speak about biographies and their role, especially in architectural practice. Rahul of RMA will also share his thoughts about the publication afterwards. I would like to inform our viewers that we have released a series of podcasts and videos related to the exhibition. And you can find them on our YouTube channel and podcasts are available on Apple and Spotify. And now I wish all of you an interesting and inspiring evening. Dear Kaiwan, please take over. Thanks, dear Bon. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you actually very much to the Goethe Foundation, uh, to the Goethe Institute and Architecture Foundation for really being the pillars that have supported uh, us in putting this exhibition together, which I think has been crucial and important at many levels, not just sort of as, as personal projects, either for Rahul Merotra and RMA Architects or for me as a curator or a critic. But I think this, this has been a project that has been very important for us because it's been about two, two and a half years of very many focused discussions and uh, a much longer series of discussions otherwise, which one can speak a little bit more about later. But I think this exhibition has been an occasion for us to explore questions, uh, ideas, thoughts that we have discussed very often about architecture, about architecture practice, uh, and especially in the context of what is India today, in a sense, the contemporary uh, of a place, the contemporary of a, of a nation, of a people that we always sort of talk about. And I think in many senses to put this exhibition together as much as it obviously is about reflecting uh, and thinking through the work of RMA architects, it has also allowed us, at least as a research team, as an installation team, as a curatorial team, to think of questions beyond uh, simply the work of RMA architects. And at that point, it would be also important to, to congratulate and, and celebrate the work of a particular practice that has given us a body of work that allows us to have these kind of conversations. And in somewhere, uh, the catalog is, uh, is an indication or a, or, a, or a direction towards these many questions that emerge by looking at a practice. So at one level, it is an exhibition about a practice. But on another level, the practice is also the occasion to open up many other conversations which we find relevant and particular to our times uh, and to our profession as it stands, uh, stands today. With this brief introduction, I think it would be best that we have a little sneak, uh, sneak peek into the exhibition for many of you all who may have not been able to visit Bombay or uh, maybe attend some of our walkthroughs, etc. Uh, we've put together, as Bjorn mentioned, uh, uh, with, with wonderful technical support, again, from the Goethe Institute, as well as uh, the Architecture Foundation, we've put together two uh, films. One is a long con kind of a curatorial statement film, which will be released on YouTube uh, in the coming week. And uh, a shorter film, which is made for Instagram viewing, which is actually a walkthrough that Rahul and myself do together as a walkthrough through the exhibition. So what we are seeing now is literally a very short six minute approximately clip from the longer YouTube film that we would be putting up in the coming week. So uh, Ila, may I request you to play the clip?
architecture of practice, research, reflections and reformulations is a mid-career retrospective exhibition of RMA architects looking at 30 years of a particular practice situated working out of Bombay as well as having a connection in Boston and what it means to understand or look at an architecture practice especially in the last 30 years. In India there's largely been a practice where monographic books, monographic exhibitions have been produced largely by the architect or by the architect's studio themselves. In this case, the architecture studio and the producers of the exhibition invite a curator to come and look at the work and put this exhibition together. For many practices that may have got established around this time period, it must have been a very, very important space to be in because the 1990s, as we all know today, are a crucial turning point, not only for history and politics in India, but for history and politics all across the world. The 1990s are marked by what we termed as globalization. The 1990s are marked by important economic developments all across the world. In India, marked by the opening up of the liberalization policy in 1991. And obviously, the, the very important uh, event which has shaped many things in contemporary India, which is the demolition of the Babri Masjid on 6 December 1992. So from economics and politics to culture, many things shifted in the 1990s. Many cities, in fact, changed their names in the mid-1990s. So what would it have meant for a very young practice to establish itself, especially in a city like Bombay, which itself was going through very drastic changes? The city of Bombay is where the urban drama, as far as India is con concerned, and even globally, plays out the strongest. So a practice to be nestled or to be sort of based in a city such as Bombay and in a country like India would be a very special moment. And when a fledgling practice is trying to shape its own career, shape its own base, shape its own ideas, you also have this tumultuous context that was, that was all around them. The practice also allows us to reflect in terms of how architecture responded to the context of this change of the 1990s, how architecture responded to the context of the city of the 1990s. The principal lead architect, the founding architect, is himself also a very important writer, researcher, activist, academic. And in that sense, Rahul Merotra has literally led these two parallel lives. On one hand, the, the life of being an architect who is running an architecture practice, an architecture studio, making buildings, but on the other hand, an architect who is constantly writing books, doing research, setting up city conferences, shaping legislation in the, in the city. But, the, but I, why I emphasize the parallelness is because both these lives were taken independently and equally seriously. One was not a hobby life of the other. So whether he was making and shaping buildings and projects or whether he was making and shaping and writing books and research programs, he did both of that with independent clarity and independent intensity. And in that sense, what is, I think, important that any architecture practice that is shaping and making buildings, this question of how alive and aware are you of the times you inhabit, the times that you contextualize in yourself in, becomes extremely and very, very important. Right at the beginning, from a curatorial perspective, there was an identification of about three key concepts. These three concepts come from me as the curator, but they also come from my understanding of what are the issues that have been influential and important for Rahul. So the three key concepts as to guide, guide me as the curator in this exhibition, the first is the question of context. Now, at one, one point, we realized that Rahul and myself both were interested in looking at context as, as a dynamic idea. For both of us, context is something that is dynamic and shaping at all points in time. What would be, for example, the context of Bombay? And at this point, I would also like to point, point you to uh, a lecture that Rahul does called The Context of Context, which is also available on YouTube. Also this question as to how architecture creates context. The second concept is something that has been of a certain kind of an urgency and concern for us, which is the issue of architecture language. I think in sort of looking at architecture in contextualized conversations, we have somewhere sort of missed out on the question that architecture is shaped by language. Like any cultural form, whether it's literature or music or theater, it's shaped by language. 
the meaning, the conversation, the message, the politics, everything is contained within that language. So the question of language was something that I wanted to essentially pick up in this, in this exhibition. And in my own observation, some of the, some of the works of RMA architects also would, would allow me to pick up this question of language as we will see later in the exhibition. And the third key concept that I wanted to pick up is the notion of continuity. The notion of continuity can be understood at two levels. One is, let's take the simple level first. You're looking at the career of a studio. You're looking at the biography of an individual and his studio. And instead of a banal sense of imagining that there is something continuity from day one to day 100 and day 1000, the notion of continuity was actually the notion of change. When there are constant changes, how does a practice maintain a sense of continuity for itself? How do we respond to the notion of continuity in terms of time and geography, in terms of city and history? What one is sort of trying to understand within the work of RMA architects is what nurtures and cultivates the connections between practice and the world of public lives. We realize that the most important and the absolutely one key question that emerged in that exhibition was the role of the architect. The role of the architect as somebody who shapes the public space or who, who sort of pushes himself or herself through his or her work was something that turned very crucial. So a curatorial... Thank you, Eva. So this is just the, just the opening of the film that will be available, which then further goes on to sort of describe the different elements in the, in the exhibition. And just to sort of continue and, and briefly complete the description of the, of the exhibition, the exhibition was imagined in three registers. As the introduction says, there is a certain contextual framework of the time period of the 1990s that was very, very important. And then there were sort of three more key concepts that were, that were identified as the reference. And from, through, uh, from that and through many, many discussions, which were very sort of uh, in the last about eight, eight to nine months, we had very structured discussions between the team at RMA. I think many people have been interested in the curatorial process and which is why I'm saying this, between the team at RMA, between conversations between Rahul, myself, uh, the, the sort of producers, the, the research team at Architecture Foundation. I think there were, there were multiple sort of uh, uh, discussions that ultimately sort of shaped into some of the key, key decisions driven by certain aspects and ideas that were identified right at the, at the beginning. And the exhibition developed in three clear registers. One was the register of the chronology, the second was the register of understanding the aspect of making in a studio and how a studio is shaped in terms of designing and making projects. And the last was to look at a portfolio of about six, uh, six projects. And this is, uh, the exhibition was sort of obviously imagined that that would be recorded, the exhibition would be represented in a, in a catalog. But as we, as the exhibition sort of opened, to various sort of, uh, as it opened, it actually also opened up many, many responses from the audiences, many, many questions that came to me, that came to Architecture Foundation, that came to Rahul Merotra, which also made us further reflect on the exhibition itself. So in a sense, there was a new life that the exhibition opened up. There were questions about what does it mean to curate an architecture exhibition as compared to an exhibition of artistic practices or works of art, or, or is it a research exhibition? Is it a, is it a sort of a project exhibition? What is the role of the models? Uh, the, the sort of the fetishization of the model as a miniature doll object to the understanding of the models as clustering themselves to, to indicate dynamic processes that may happen in the life of a particular, particular project to the question of what is the, where is the author voice, where is the curator voice? So a range of different, a range of different questions, questions emerged. And that actually pushed, uh, pushed us once again to look at a, a, a long series of, of research conversations that Rahul and myself were anyways having for this, for this exhibition. And irrespective of that, it has been about 10 years to one of our very first published uh, conversations between the, between the two of us. 
And actually those research conversations shaped into about a four part large interview, which actually we did twice in a sense. One, we did it as a, as a very internal conversational space discussing many things. Uh, and that was then sort of transcribed and shaped into a literally 27,000 word long conversation, which is edited and now available in the catalog. And in fact, becomes one of the, one of the mainstays uh, of, the, of the catalog. And, uh, and, and we wanted to sort of preface that by a series of smaller project-oriented conversations that, that we had had. So in a sense, the catalog that actually enlarged from the exhibition to much larger, much larger conversations that the exhibition itself sort of pushed us in. And then we re redid this conversation, not in exactly sort of repeating the same thing, but in the same model to actually develop a, a four part podcast uh, series, which is already available on Spotify and Apple uh, for, for, for listening. So at this stage, maybe I can, uh, I can request uh, Ela to, uh, to, to take us through, a, we'll just go through a, a few selected pages of the catalog so the audience may have a sense of what the catalog uh, looks and feels like. Thanks so much. May I at this point uh, invite uh, Tridit Sarut, the provost at uh, SEPT University and also a very important scholar for all of us in, in India. Uh, on behalf of Rahul Merotra, RMA Architects and the Goethe Institute Mumbai to release the, the catalog for us, Tridit. Rahul, it means that I have not read the catalog. It it, it arrived in the <laughs> afternoon and they wanted to pack it immediately for the book release. So, uh, 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 you know, we will. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tridip. Uh, thank you, Tridip. Thank you. This was important for, for both of us. Uh, also, because the catalog, uh, if I may, if I may say a little bit uh, before inviting, uh, before inviting Rahul, uh, the catalog was also imagined as a kind of an extension to, to Rahul's very important uh, book released last year, first by Architangle and then by the SEPT University Press uh, in India, uh, working in Mumbai. And the catalog, the exhibition in some form are developments and extensions, which is why even the layout, uh, the format of the book is, is, is sort of the, the structure of the, 
the physical structure of the book is very close to the working in Mumbai uh, shape and shape and size. With this Rahul, uh, it would be it would be important for us to hear from you what it has meant to to have this exhibition and then to sort of have the catalog as the author of many of these projects that we have been talking about and shaping a kind of practice. Uh, thank you, Kaivan. Uh, I, I, I won't take very much time because I'd like to hear the conversation between you and Tridip, but I just want to make two or three points. Uh, first, I'd like to just start by, you know, thanking uh, the Goethe Institute um, for, for this invitation to do the exhibition. Uh, and I say this in the context of um, the fact that at least for me personally, and I think for RMA architects too, uh, institutional collaborations have been very key uh, to the way the practice has been nurtured, I think more intellectually than anything else, uh, which is the Urban Design Research Institute, the Goethe Institute. These are very old relationships um, that really, I think inform the practice in many ways, many of the sections that you talk about. So it was a real pleasure and we are very grateful to the Goethe Institute for having kind of in a sense celebrated that 30 years uh, of collaboration. And similarly with SEPT, uh, which is uh, you know, a relationship I have which goes even older, uh, I think uh, I'm grateful that Tridip has uh, joined this conversation representing SEPT too, besides his own uh, position as a scholar, but also for them having supported the book Working in Mumbai. Uh, and so in a sense, um, uh, uh, you know, coming on the heels of the book Working in Mumbai, I think this exhibition for us was very important from many perspectives. And I think I'd like to kind of broaden it uh, more in a way that it might resonate as a question, you know, for us as practitioners more broadly, which is that Working in Mumbai was a reflection and a very personal reflection actually of 30 years of work. Um, you know, working in Mumbai, of course, used emblematically, uh, but it was uh, it, it, it was most, more closed in that one covered the projects that were done. And I think in this exhibition as a curator, I think because you opened up in a sense the future, you included projects uh, that were under construction it became a snapshot in a moment uh, and it became also projective in terms of us suddenly becoming conscious about uh, aspects the rubrics that you've used which uh, are harder to write about in self-reflection and it comes from a third and an external eye uh, and i think that was interesting so in short it really became a snapshot in a moment of the practice founded on conversations uh, that we've had for 10 years, but also the reflections that I made for 30 years in the book Working in Mumbai. But in a sense, to use it as a moment to also project uh, things that were ongoing. Uh, I think for us, that was very interesting. In many ways, also, it captures now in reflection and having seen the catalog, a moment in time for us in the city, in the country, on this planet, which was the pandemic. Uh, and it, it's very interesting that in a moment like this, where one is in a hyper virtual mode, uh, because the Max Muller Bhavan, the Goethe Institute, RMA architects are in the same neighborhood, we had to literally walk across the street with our models. And so in a moment where we've gone hyper virtual, you chose to go hyper sort of in person uh, or, or in, in tangibility in terms of the object and many objects sort of filling the space, which allowed at least the people who had the privilege or the advantage of being around and being able to walk through the exhibition to sense the kind of tangibility of the work uh, and the process that sort of goes into the making uh, of buildings uh, through the process of model making and other instruments. So I think those were the few things that were very important. And, and lastly, really, it, your emphasis on focusing on the process rather than products and the confidence to even include projects that hadn't been finished, uh, I think for us was very interesting because it kind of made us um, project and try to connect the reflections to things that were going on and might happen in the future. Uh, so for us as a practice, RMA Architects, I think uh, that from your side and the Goethe Institute uh, was um, uh, much, uh, much appreciated. And I think we're all deeply um, uh, kind of really appreciative of the fact that the Goethe Institute invited us to do that, the support we got, and Kaivan, your input um, uh, as a curator. So I think with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. Thank you so very much. And 
it's wonderful to have uh, Tridip with us. And uh, with Tridip, it's, I think, been many ongoing conversations uh, in the general sphere of reflecting on histories, reflecting on biographies, which is an area that Tridip works in, which is an area that interests me. I know some of some conversations that Rahul and Tridip have had, when, especially also when they released the India edition of Working in Mumbai. And I thought it would be it would be nice to have a reflection on this question of what do biographies do and why are biographies uh, biographies important for the broader framework of thinking about our culture, thinking about our our practices. And through the before even we speak more specifically of architecture, it would be wonderful to hear from from you and your and your work in this area the role that biographies and these kind of reflections uh, play in the in the practices or the lives that we that we occupy thank you kaiwan and thank you rahul um, thank you everybody at rma um, for making me part of this set of conversations they always remain incomplete uh, because kaiwan has to rush back to bombay uh, um, so um, um, uh, these are you know, unfinished um, conversations. Um, Kaiwan, you know, uh, if you really look at the, both the biography and the autobiographical tradition in, in India, um, um, there has been a one large absence there. Um, um, and that's, um, that's either a biography or an autobiography, largely of a person who works with her or his hands. Hmm. Um, 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 so, so the, the idea of making and the idea of thinking about making, the idea of making and telling the story of how that came to be made um, has been largely absent from our intellectual tradition. Um, and and that, that's true uh, of architecture, that's true of design, that's true of, of artisanal practices, that's true hmm. of craft practices. That's true also of uh, national figures who worked with their hands. Uh, so you don't have, um, you know, every image of Gandhi has him working with his hands. Then of course, uh, you know, now we prefer him to be silent, but um, otherwise he used to, to work. But there's no biography of Gandhi as a worker, for example, oh. somebody who worked through materials, through practices. So it's very important therefore in that context that reflections begin to emerge on what is it to work? What is it to work with one's hands? What is it to make? What is it, and this kind of making which happens in a place, in a context, what is it to collaborate on work? Okay. So in that, you know, so I, I think uh, both the, the earlier book, I mean, the, I, mean I, I see this as a continuum, um, the book working in Mumbai, the exhibition, and now the with catalog, which is, which aspires to be something beyond the catalog. It's, oh, it, it's oh. therefore the, the conversation that you have with Rahul, which is incorporated here, becomes very important. Uh, I think it's, it's serving a very large need uh, of us thinking about work, thinking about the lives of those who work, um, um, the collaborations that happen, the materiality of that work, uh, and and um, and I think that's the only way we would be able to challenge uh, a very very deep Indian bias towards uh -huh. those who work uh, and and the practice of working. Um, you know, we we've always valorized people who have not worked. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So all the architects of modern India, that great series that all of us grew up reading, didn't have any worker in it. Uh -huh. Huh. Uh, these were all people who built something without actually ever soiling their hands. Huh. Uh, and I, I think there is a huge correction required. It's, it's both a political correction, but more importantly, a sociological correction huh. that's required. And unless we begin to look at work seriously, those who work, the, the, the work person seriously, and the nature of collaboration and materiality that it involves fundamentally differently, uh, mm -hmm. we are never going to look at uh, the entire practice of work mm, and working with one hands or 
or thinking with one hands hmm. see thanks thanks tridip very important for taking my question in this uh, in this direction because actually uh, at the cost of maybe repeating myself you know the way people first responded to the models one like i was literally sort of saying you know stop thinking of these as beautiful objects which they are no doubt that they are not but the fact that they were models on which discussions happened on which sort of the 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 model maker the architect the intern at the office all of them would sort of keep passing by that table and work on the models and if you saw that long table of models it was also that every project had a cluster and each project had its own cluster depending on the process and i think uh, without being so conscious in the way that you have uh, the way you have articulated this i think that was somewhere playing on the back of one's mind that how is a certain production uh being sort of uh, uh uh literally produced or laid out and then to see the mock up of the louvers behind in the exhibition was literally i remember that when the sep building was in construction that kind of a mock up was done on site maybe between between the team of architects the designer of the louver ismat khambata's office uh as well as the workers and 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 rahul sort of mentions and his team i remember i remember discussion with his team with robert and payal where they very specifically mentioned certain contractors certain sort of carpenters that were essential in developing in developing details so these are these are small things which have played i think on the mind and somewhere come into the into the conversation but thank you very much for for taking it in that in that direction so so tridip to sort of follow up that that question with uh taking a step and expanding it uh, which is to say that you know when uh one is putting together institutional archives or when is one is say at at sept which is which is now a very structured program you were you were very important in laying out that program uh, a few years ago and now sort of mentoring it the sept press which is which is looking at looking at publications and we sort of struggle between these these monographs individual oriented uh way of looking it versus when you collect a set of drawings uh uh you know i remember professor shrivatsan putting a little book uh on uh, this architect in the in the archive we've discussed some some reflections on the way drawings and that kind of material comes into the archive how would we see this material as a way of thinking about the questions of practice in the in the future and what does it mean for education or professional reflections it, you know it's it's just to um it's too nascent really to boast about the archive but i think uh, in about 50 years 60 years from now uh, um um uh, research scholars students and practitioners would actually look upon this endeavor as something of great value uh, great value for two reasons um i think there is um if you really look at the repositories um in india neither does the national archive not the nehru memorial or any or other state archives have actually played paid attention to design architecture um i mean just i mean among the other things that they've left out but design and architecture are two things that they've left out In, including including the 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 drawings of um of the imperial capital the drawings of the imperial capital are not in the archives they are with the cpwd so i think it's important that we begin to look at what we have done in terms of shaping um, contemporary india and in in this case it's not going to be only contemporary india probably would be south asia uh, mm. that's that being the impression so that's that's one very important service that the archive would pro provide it's also becomes a history of ideas in terms of pedagogy um, you know rahul um, uh, and we were talking about how it would be important to archive the student work and he has come forward to begin that process by saying you know i have my my work of student days at sept and here i am willing to share it with the archives now that becomes very important because when you really want to write the history of the education and modern professional education in india architecture and design would play a very important role um so you have a foundational document something like the eames report the india report hmm. and, 
and then nothing um, for the last 70 years. Right? I mean, have we, have we not gone beyond? Have we not challenged? Have we played around with the IMSS report? What have we done in terms of design, in terms of architecture? So, so the archives would become very important. Also, I think it's important in India to create university presses. Let's understand that this great country has not produced one sustainable university press. All the university presses finally print exam papers. And once the exam papers begin to get leaked, they even stop printing exam papers. Uh, so the, the Delhi University Press doesn't exist. Uh, um, Calcutta University Press doesn't exist. So I think except Rahul, Bimal, Srivatsan, and others came together to think of creating a university press that we actually could sustain uh, and which would be meaningful in the context of our, our role uh, in, in this scenario in which we find ourselves. We have 490 odd design and architecture institutions in the country and not one press dedicated to doing uh, publication series, catalog kind, um, peer reviewed essays, uh, student work, pedagogical discussions. I think we need to really, if we want to take design education and architectural education seriously as an intellectual exercise, uh, then we need to create possibilities of those discourses. And I think between the archive and the press, uh, this would be two public endeavors that SEPT would, would do. And in, with both, um, um, Rahul, as you know, has been very intimately um, yeah. connected. And, and, and uh, oh. that's what we're hoping to do. Um, and, and so, and it will sustain itself only if people buy books. So I mean, everybody here, 49 people, please buy the books. Uh, I am, um, I'm, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks for the pitch also also yeah, I mean, I, yeah. in, <laughs> one thing that you learn being in Ahmedabad that it's it's never it's never one should be ashamed of saying dando <laughs> right? every opportunity one does dando sure <laughs> sure 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 thanks thanks Tridip. uh Tridip, uh, uh you've been gen very generous and i'm going to take that uh, uh like literally latch on to that a little bit more and ask you you know one of the other things that emerged in discussing or ex ex explaining this exhibition to a lot of enthusiastic students audiences and audiences that have also been non-architecture audiences i think that's been uh, uh, uh wonderful for us and and also what shaped into conversations with our research team or with rahul was that we realized that from obsessing over sort of individual projects, the exhibition, although it had a portfolio of six projects, mm -hmm. besides saying that one sentence that is a portfolio of six projects, either in terms of drawings or in terms of models or photographs, it constantly spoke about a sense of a practice. And, and the question of, and then I think we can extend that question to the question of profession. And that is what comes across more strongly uh, as Rahul responds in the conversation that is that is now published in this in this book, and it would be really wonderful to hear from from a person like you, this this question of looking at practices, this question of looking at certain certain professional continuities or professional questions, and I think this is becoming, as we all know, quite urgent in many professions that have had a history in the twentieth century and today are responding to very different economic and political political situations. And so again, as, as the way you sort of look at SEPT or the way you look at the broader questions of publications, the way you put it, one would really like to hear from you on this question of practice and profession. No, okay, well, um, if I, if I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you a straight answer, but if I want to look at in a long durée, Hmm, hmm. kind of a thing. We don't have a language to speak of practices hmm. and professions. Right? Uh, if you really look at, um, if you really look at accounts, uh, either by, in terms of self-narratives or in terms of biographical narratives hmm. or in terms of academic accounts, um, okay. you don't have, let's, let's, let's look at the professions, modern professions. Do we have an adequate history of engineering? 
one major study. That's it. Hmm? Do we have an adequate study of the way medicine came to India with, with, with the exception of some work that done under the subaltern studies and hmm. Right and 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 David Ar Arnold and, and a few others and, and and then sociologists looking at it. No, we don't have uh, or you right. know um, medical practice. Strangely, we have nothing for law. I mean, you right. have you know uh, I mean all these reverend judges writing about themselves in very superlative terms, um, but it doesn't give you a sense of what the practice mm -hmm. of law has been and how it has changed. Right. So uh, and so more so when the practice is really done is done with hands with materials. For example, we do not have uh, any account that I know of. I mean, there are, I know that some accounts have started coming up as to what has happened to carpentry, right, right, right. Or, or, or what has happened to to weaving, what has happened to to, to sandal making, uh, what's mm. more. Um, you know, Archana um, Shah Rahul's dear friend has just come out with a book on, on working with hands in a very different yes. context in terms of craft. But these are very few and far between. So okay. we don't ne actually have the language to speak mm. of professions. We are, I think, all the attempts that you've been part of and Rahul has done and others are doing, and maybe when we do uh, the book with Abin. That will give us some yes. sense of that, and uh, you know, um, uh, and and we did uh, uh, a few other things. Those things will actually create the vocabulary as to how does one begin to speak and think of practice of various kinds. Mm. And it's only when you have a vocabulary for that will you be able to create a sense of how a profession works. You know. For example, uh, nowhere do we find mentions of economics in it, mm. right? I mean, mm. somebody is putting in putting in cash, things right. cost, right? Um, um, and I, I think when we really get into the professional aspects of it, the political economy of, of making things, of, of doing projects yes. become yes. important to who your clients are uh, and why is it that you have clients of a certain kind, or where you have a large range of clients, is government your client? What happens when uh, large capital becomes your client? When what happens when a public institution is your client? Hmm. Does economics really change or the political economy change? We don't have, we have not asked these questions of our professions. Right. 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 We've asked them in certain contexts uh, in terms of saying, how does the state acquire services of a professional? Um, Right. And, and then there's a lot of contestation happens as to whether uh, professional A or professional B should have been hired, what the process mm. should have been. But really, we haven't, we've really not thought through uh, these things as, as either academics, historians, social theorists, or even as practitioners. And that's mm. not only true of architecture, but it's true of all modern professions. So the only craft that people talk about, sort of uh, mystery about it, yeah. or the only profession, is the, the profession of being a writer. <laughs> right? and, and, and nobody I talks know. about nobody talks about the economics of writing. Mm -hmm. We talk about the advances that people receive, but we don't talk about the advances that people never receive. <laughs> right? and so, so I'm saying, We've really not, right. we've not done the right. work. And I think that's why uh, what's happened in the last four months, uh, just uh, conversing with Rahul on, on the earlier book, and then I, I, couldn't, I couldn't come to the exhibition, uh, but then looking at this um, um, are, are very, very crucial. And that's, that's the kind of institutional role that I see for ourselves. Thanks, Tridip. You've... Uh raise some absolutely wonderful and very, very important questions. And I think when we talk of research, institutional, university level research, academic research, or research as a professional space and practice, I think some of these questions are not only necessary, but they are also becoming urgent in the way the, the discussions in the profession are shaping, whether you talk about the architect as the lifestyle architect, 
or whether you talk about the architect in, in very dynamic and much debated public projects. And, and rather than discussing those as independent cases, I think to put them in the perspectives that you have outlined this evening is, is very, very important. I'm really tempted to sort of be uncivil and draw you more and more, but I will, right. one, I will be one, civil. One, one, one more, one, okay. One, one. I, was, I was really thinking, really thinking on the questions of archives and I'm tempted to ask you because you uh, uh, have been somebody who's genuinely worked with archival material, reading through texts, but also handling, I think, objects, uh, uh, you know, at, at something like maybe Gandhi Ashram, et cetera, museums. Uh, when we speak of material cultures, the way you were describing the question of work, hands, et cetera, I think also in architecture, and, and this is raising many questions between what you were saying and the experience of the exhibition also, the archives that we have or the archival objects and what will be our, our struggles with, with that kind of a that kind of a thing, you know, I, I Kevin, I think there are two things. One is mm. that um, not every repository is an archive, and I think we've begun Thank to you. use this word archive rather Thank loosely yeah. Yeah. and in a, in a completely ahistorical manner. Um, right. uh, an archive is is something that a historian or a practitioner or a researcher creates. Um, I create as an institution a repository mm -hmm. and, and you enter it and curate it for your own needs and take something out of it and you make that an archive. So I think um, archive um, is something that a historian, and I'm using the word historian to mean anybody who walks in and out of an archive or a repository mm -hmm. does. So uh, your notion um, uh, of the British Museum or the British Library and my notion of the British Library are very different. We go there um, and maybe have a cup of tea outside, but when we enter it, we are looking at a different, we're looking at the repository very differently. Mm. Uh, and that is a distinction that we must make. Um, two, I am somewhat perplexed um, uh, that everybody and their aunt wants to create an archive, right? So Ahmedabad city uh, now, thinks of five archives or six archives. And I, I tell them that if you don't have a hundred year view, please don't. Uh, uh. Yeah? Hundred year view in, in the sense that uh, what you collect, you're going to keep for a hundred years minimally, right? That you have the resources to keep an activity going for at least a hundred years. And you are going to train human resources continuously for the next century. Because lo and behold, you do not have a single course in this country which trains anybody to be a curator of a repository. The National mm. Archive of India does something, but it's, 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 it's largely an in-house thing. So everybody that we hire uh, or any archive in this country hires is actually a lapse researcher. Right? I mean, I would actually not want to be an archivist. I would want to be a historian. But I mean, let, let, let me look after Kaiman's research needs rather than write my own research papers. So I, I think we need to create a professional group of people who would look at the repositories differently. And therefore, something like the SEPT archives will have a different kind of challenge because uh, it's one thing to collect paper. It's another thing to collect models. It's third thing to actually create, collect tools, for example. Mm, uh, mm. Because the tools of the practice have changed. Right? Um, um, who uses a set square? Uh, and, and so actually, uh, when, when uh, we, we decided to archive Kamal Mangal Das's office, entire practice, one thing that I insisted was that he give us all the tools that he used. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, which, which may not be of any consequence today, but 150 years, 200 yes. years from now, uh, when you look at, I think so, uh, um, this entire act of archiving um, has to be um, done with a sense of uh, at least a century um, mm. in, in everything that we do, in terms of practices that we do. And therefore, it's... Um, Only institutions will be able to do that. Um, and, and then there would be a 
a great discernment required as to mm. what you collect, mm. what is it that you not collect. Uh, there is a great temptation that to say, well, you know, we'll digitize everything and everything will be available in a digital sense. And that's mm. something that, you know, we all participate in. I mean, we, we while I was at the Sabarmati Ashram, we digitized, what, 2.5 million pages. And they're mm. in the public domain. But there is no replacing the physical. Uh, right. Also, let's not forget that we do not know what the shape of the digital technology is going to be in another eight years or 10 years. Uh, so both storage and retrieval systems have to be physical if you want to keep something. What has worked for the past two millennia is that the paper has been available to us and we know how to retrieve mm -hmm. paper. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't, we can't retrieve a single file that was created before 2000, digital mm -hmm. file. Right? So I think there are questions around mm -hmm. our, our, our fascination with the digital world. Uh, uh, digital world and archives don't go together. Digital technology is very important for dissemination of the repository. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. is used, but it is not a replacement for the physical repository itself. So there are these questions that we are grappling with. There are no easy answers. I have one way of looking at things. Somebody else will have another way of looking at it. Um, um, but nobody wants to create, actually sit down and create archives. Uh -huh. you know, everybody thinks of themselves as creating archives, but no, I mean, um, um, we are not doing it. Thank you, Tridiv. Very, very generous. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. And I think this was, uh, this is what we, what we hoped to sort of use the occasion of the exhibition, use the occasion of the catalog to have sort of uh, thinking through these questions, but still at a slant, uh, kind of say it at a slant kind of a thing. And, and I think this has brought out very important What you wanted to on... say is that you are a <laughs> ha, but I can be I can give a more corny statement, but in the fact yeah. that we are in a public conversation, I'll be civil, uh, as I said. <laughs> but Ritim, no, seriously, thank you very, very much for taking some of these. Because I think I think it's important precisely for the conversations that Rahul and myself are having, and when people have the occasion to read uh, the interview, I think it is the question of how you take professional questions into larger questions and bring them back to the profession, not sort of get lost again in this mumbo jumbo world of interdisciplinary multidisciplinary because again as you said about archives i think everybody loves to talk about it but not do anything about it so in the same way to take conversations out and bring them back to the profession back to the practice so thank you very much because you've thank you've you. given us a lot to sort of take forward and and think through so i'm i'm really very happy and and so happy that thank you, you. Uh, agreed to be with us uh, this great this pleasure week. great pleasure great pleasure before i open up uh, for audience questions if there are any i know this was on not on schedule but rahul i'm really sort of tempted to invite you or ask you if you have some things to share uh, i'm i'm sure your your head is buzzing with many many thoughts in the conversation that we've had and i really don't want to lose this moment and opportunity to hear you uh, uh, after this conversation that we've we've had, in the context that you've just had this, it is it is the work of RMA architects. It is thirty years of reflection of your own thoughts, etc. And and there is a conversation that we are having uh, on the basis of what you've allowed us to share in the public space, in the public sphere, in that sense. Thank you. Okay, Ivan, I was not really prepared for this, but I know, uh, I know, now I that know, you've but I've taken the. I'm, I'm sort of, I know I'm doing this here, yeah. but you'll forgive no, me. No, no, you know, there are two things that come out of, uh, I think, what Tridip said, which I think for me are very, very important. One is, I think, the way he kind of picked up on the word work, um, which uh, is, uh, I must admit, one had intuitively uh, tried to respond to that question, even in the title of the last book, Working in Mumbai. Uh, but I think Tridip, your framing and reframing of it is is, is very helpful. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I'd kind of even go, just one step beyond, which is, I think, implicit in what uh, Tridip was doing, 
which is why it was working in Mumbai, because if I was saying working in London or working in Paris or working in Boston or working in Chennai, I think there are other implications of the context that surround the meaning of the word is appreciation and even its very formulation, right? Uh, I mean, I think when we did the SEPT release of the work, word, uh, the uh, book Working in Mumbai, uh, I mean, I think uh, Sri Watson was the one who bought up and intersected it with labor. Now, that is one formulation of the idea of work, which is very specific uh, within kind of histories of intellectual discourse, which, you know, look at labor movements and all of that, right? But I mean, I like the way that Tridip has formulated this in its kind of broadest sense of, of work and, and, and what work means. Uh, and, and the way it actually in, intersects also with thinking, no, in some way. Uh, and so I think that is, and then that is kind of related to the question of the archive, which I think the Tridip has complicated in a nice way for us, besides the discernment that is uh, critical in, in making an archive, uh, besides the, the long durée uh, of what one imagines uh, is the usefulness of the archive, uh, I think also its formulation, and I think discernment and durée are related to that. Its formulation of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of uh, well, at one level, it being neutral in the way Tridip said that everyone goes and and culls out of an archive a completely different reading of the material. Uh, that I think uh, for the profession, it's very critical uh, that we move this debate to this sort of landscape of ideas, uh, because then that opens up whether it's us looking at other archives in terms of our own nourishment, uh, but also in us becoming a little more conscious about how we formulate whether the notion of working or whether what we can learn from someone else's archive, right? Uh, I mean, I think uh, just the idea of having instruments as part of this, and this is a discussion I also had with, uh, 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 with Tridip in the same context that if we, one was putting student work to know, to see the rapidographs of the two, to be pencil from which certain drawings are made at a certain time actually tells you a lot about the way your mind and hand connect, no? Because the instruments then become very important. And so, I mean, I think some, those were some of the interesting things that just came out of your conversation, uh, at least for me. And I think in that context, more pointedly to your question, uh, I, I, I think in some ways, uh, the exhibition, the catalog that you've put together and the conversations that surrounded it in, in all these broader ways uh, have alluded to this, which I think Tridip mm. has bought into a much finely articulated kind of uh, uh, explanation. Uh, we might not have even been conscious about some of this in the way that uh, I think Tridip has made us conscious. And I think for me, at least those would be good questions to build on and write about. Um, and thank you for those prompts and inspirations to them. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Rahul. And uh, yes, I think just, just a last little bit of mention on this. I, I remember, and it's been important in another project, but also when we put the exhibi exhibition together, I was discussing with Rahul how thinking through axonometrics uh, has made a difference to the way certain buildings are imagined as, as against the question of the walkthrough. Uh, for example. So I think some of these questions on, on tools of the trades, methods used, methods working, not working, I think are, are, are important question. And I think exercises like this have constantly allowed us to open up questions beyond the, the structure and scope of an exercise itself. And actually in that spirit, uh, along with the exhibition, we had uh, five uh, book releases which were actually in a way talking about how practice gets extended, number one. And two is the, is the confluences between practice and practice and research, which in the case of uh, Merotra and RMA Architects, I think has been, has been important. So we saw, the, we saw the release of Mumbai Reader, which is, uh, I wouldn't say annual, but it's a cyclical production of the Urban Design Research Institute, where every year or year and a half uh, they put together a compilation of the most latest writings on the city of Mumbai, and sometimes they are thematized. This one was thematized on the question of uh, the pandemic, the city in the pandemic, and it also uh, the the conversation that was that centered at the release of that book was on the question of civil society and the space of uh, the urban. Uh, 
Uh, the other book that got uh, released during the exhibition was a book on Hathigao, which is actually a series of multiple voices, uh, including the architect's voice, yes, but a multiple set of voices that came into the project, either as responses in the process, et cetera. And that's interesting what an architecture project generates as its afterlife sometimes in a, in a way, including a visiting architect sort of narration of what he saw in that space and how he responded. We also, uh, we also released uh, uh, Extreme Urbanism, Sanitation as Infrastructure, which is again a series of book that uh, Mehrotra has been putting together, which comes out of his uh, studios. And I think again, where, uh, where certain urgencies and questions from his practice flow into the studio, and then the studio comes back to the city with ideas and with propositions. And I think that series has been very interesting and this is what we released. And the other two books were, were the two books uh, that uh, come from uh, Rahul himself, working in Mumbai, which we've spoken about much this evening, but also the, the recently put together compilation of uh, Rahul Merotra's writing over the last 30 years, which is Kinetic City and other essays currently published by Architangle. That book also also was was released. So this has been this has been our uh, our two months with the with the exhibition. As I mentioned earlier, and just for the sake of everybody's access, I would mention it more clearly. We have put together a longish film on the exhibition, which will be up on YouTube, along with all the book discussions, the thematic discussions around books that we have had. All this material will come up on YouTube by next week. We have a short walkthrough of the exhibition that Rahul and myself did together, which will come up on Instagram uh, in, in the next day. And obviously the catalog is, is, is out there and published and released today. And uh, you could be in touch with the Architecture Foundation or contact the Goethe Institute and further details on how you could buy or get the catalog uh, will be, will be available, available for you. Uh, if there are maybe one or two questions from the audience, one would be happy to happy to take it. But it's been a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you, everyone. So, are there any questions, Ila or Amrita? I think there is one. Yeah. Up, yeah. one. There is yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw that. I think it's for you. Oh, okay. I'll just quickly read it out. We often think of project and practice as mutually exclusive project and practice right from when students enter architecture school in India very rarely does the practice of architecture reflect influence academic investigations do you think there is a need and or a space for academia well I think this this was an important question for us and which is why what I mentioned in the conversation with Tridib also that the question of practice was uh, was sort of given prerogative given the space rather than sort of the project by project thinking, because I think the question of continuity, the question, the professional questions that Pradeep also sort of in, uh, instigated this evening, I think those are very, very important. And I think they are also very important in how we then look at our own uh, practice, profession and roles uh, in the sphere. So where we, we obviously have a client or a patron, we have a certain sphere that we work in. But how do you sort of shape these questions constantly? And, and in that sense, the practice uh, becomes very, very important. And in fact, if you, if you, if you listen to or read uh, the podcast or the interview, actually Rahul outlines quite interestingly uh, the questions in the first sort of five years to a decade of a practice and how that's a, that's a time that, that becomes sort of very important to shape certain indications, directions, questions for a practice. And I think as much as they come from independent and individual projects, they actually accumulate and build over a period of time. So this questions of accumulation and building is I think not only important in the questions that we've had this evening, but I think yes, somewhere in the way we shape uh, conversations, whether it's seminars or studios, I think the question of practice needs to be much more, much more sort of highlighted or put in, put in front. Hopefully that, that sort of, I'm curious about how practice of RMA think about the ability of its work, architecture buildings to transform change over time. Rahul, you want to take that question? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, 
Yes, I think in many ways, one has become more conscious about it uh, more recently when one has tried to, you know, even theorize over the last maybe almost two decades that, you know, starting with the kinetic city, the notion of ephemeral urbanism. So one is much more conscious about it now also uh, within a broader framework of theoretical thinking. But really, actually, uh, the thing that has really informed the way we've thought about change is the work we did in conservation. Uh, and at some point, one became very, um, very conscious, uh, let me say, in the, at the end of the first decade, because, you know, when we were first doing conservation, we were just doing it as a response because we emotively felt buildings needed to be saved or their lives began to get extended. And we were always interested in the notion of recycling and reuse. So if you look at even in working in Mumbai, the section on conservation, it's largely it's it's very little of it is conservation for the sake of conservation, which I'm not saying is not important. It's very important. But most of it was about adapting, reusing uh, and making, uh, you know, kind of leveraging uh, the material advantages that already existed. In that context, one learned something which I felt was very significant at that moment, which is the notion of the material life cycles. That's the life cycles of materials in buildings. And one realized that as a conservationist, all the problems when you look at conservation lie at that point where two materials of two different material life cycles touch each other. So if oh. you have a wood beam that goes into a stone wall, they clearly have completely different recycling, I mean, uh, different material lives. And that's where the problems sort of occur. And at some point, this learning began to inform our buildings. And so, for example, uh, one of the we did Shanti uh, is where we actually made a diagram of it, where you have the base of the building made from local stone, and then you have the roofs that float above it made of a completely different material, almost allowing that roof to be transformed at a much quicker uh, life cycle than the wall, which will be stable, right? And so therefore the separation of these two materials emblematically in a project like that, it was the beginning of beginning to imagine, accept, uh, and embrace change, uh, albeit uh, as components of the building rather than the building per se, uh, which was, I think, uh, for me at least, a very, very important way. And it took us about 10 or 15 years to formulate this as clearly, clearly as I've described it, but it became a way uh, to not only begin to embrace the temporal dimension, uh, but also to uh, bring the learnings from conservation embedded in the understanding of the life cycle of materials, which also has a temporal implication, but how that could inform the way materials are separated. I would say the same for the SEPT library, which is even more recent, where the outer facade is the louvers are made in plywood uh, and the inner building, because SEPT library is in my mind, three buildings that nestle into each other. So the outer and the inner building have, uh, uh, have materials used there where the life cycles are much more different from the other components of the building. And the idea being at that point, it was an economic constraint that the book stacks, we could not afford to do them in well-seasoned wood, for example, or even metal. And so it was plywood, uh, but that can easily be transformed in 20 years without ruining the integrity of the conceptual idea of the building. Uh, and similarly, the louvers, uh, they're right now in plywood, treated with a mono coat, uh, but uh, you know, in 20 years, there might be better materials, which will be more exciting, more sustainable. I don't know uh, that they could kind of uh, embrace change. So I think change, you could look at at two levels. Of course, you could look at it at the urban level, which is where mm -hmm. the ephemeral urbanism, kinetic city become theoretical frames, but you can look at them as uh, use as use per se, where buildings get recycled, but you can also look at uh, use and the temporal scale at the level of material in the way I've just described. I hope that answers the yeah. question. Actually also to draw, draw attention to uh, the six projects that feature in the exhibition more prominently, also talk about a certain sense of accumulating over time. So for example, the Prince of Wales or the CSMVS project is an incremental sort of a project that takes shape over a long period of time through smaller inserts or some of the, or the two other institutional projects uh, of RMA architects in Ahmedabad, which is Ahmedabad University and the policy, public policy building at IIM, actually respond to the question that programs may change soon or transform over time. And how will architecture 
that is designed to be complete today still continue to respond transformation that may come soon at the heels literally of the complete of the completion of the of the building so i think it's also a question of the contemporary in architecture responding to that programs may transform much faster today than they have in the past and and what would be the armature or the or the architectural imagination uh, for that i just thought i should i should draw attention to this uh, in that with this i think uh, thank you everybody for a, for a wonderful evening and for joining us i would especially thank bjorn kettles amrita nemevent and the entire team at the goethe institute who've been there all these sort of two months with the exhibition helping us in every single way uh ria rimshi and uh ila uh at the architecture foundation managing the entire project uh, of the exhibition and these two months of all these events conversations shooting our videos speaking etc and uh uh thank you very very much to rma architects the accumulation of ideas and people which are beautifully portrayed in that pinwheel which you see in working in mumbai but you also see it in the in the catalog i think that beautiful sense of how ideas accumulate into a studio and sort of these 30 years of projects and practice that they have given us which has allowed us many many conversations and 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 finally tridip thank you so very much for being with us this evening and uh, really opening up the questions uh, for us beyond this exhibition and the and the book and raul thank you very very much with this Thanks. good night everybody and make sure that you watch the films enjoy the films and all the other material that will come up on different platforms and the podcasts are already available uh, uh they have they were released in the first month of the exhibition itself thank you everybody thank you to thank you everyone thank you bye 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 take care thank you bye bye